morning, everybody. Welcome to the Rock here in Pinetown, and it's great to see your faces. We had a great uh, meeting yesterday. Um, let me go through our course, the root and the branches, and it was fantastic to see the, uh, the, the amount of people that actually responded to it. And it's good for us to get back and to know our Hebraic roots because that's where Christianity came from and grew from, and that's what we should be aware of. Unfortunately, due to uh, the, the way the church has moved over the last 1,700 years, we have grown away from the reality of where we came came from. So it's great to see you guys here this morning. As I was thinking yesterday, um, I, I was preparing all week with the PowerPoint and concentrating on the Saturday morning display or, or with, the, with the Root and the Branches course. And uh, then I realized uh, that I was ministering this morning as well. <laughs> And, but the Lord spoke to my heart, and he spoke to me about something that was very real, and it came to me through something that I was, uh, uh, when I was studying in the actual um, uh, course, it came to me about communion, and the communion was something that, uh, that I felt was, was really, really good. Because when I read in, in to the part where the two men on the road to Emmaus, when they they didn't know who, they didn't recognize Jesus, they didn't recognize who he was. They were walking along and they were saddened in the face because they expect the Redeemer to come along as a king and to set them free from the Romans. But this didn't happen, and they were so disappointed with this whole thing. And it was only a little bit later as he was talking to them and he explained to him, starting from the book of Moses, in other words, not just from the book of Moses, but starting from the Torah, which Moses wrote. So starting from Genesis, because in Genesis there, we find that's the first time that we actually get um, a, a prophecy coming about the Messiah, Genesis 3, verse 15. And, the, and God said that to, to, the, to the snake, he said that you will crawl in your belly, and he said, to the, and your seed will be at enmity with the seed of the woman. And then we see that the seed of the woman is, is, is Jesus. And we see that those who are in Christ are at enmity with those who are not. And we find this coming more and more and more, and we're getting it in many, many different ways. We're getting it in our finances. We're getting it in our bodies, in our aches, in our pains. We're seeing it in our world. We're seeing it in our climate. We're seeing it everywhere. It's all over the world. But Jesus said, fear not, and we must not fear, we must stick to the truth, and we must not go, as Matthew 24 says, be aware of deception. We must not be deceived in anything. We keep the path. If I want to walk out of this place, I will walk straight. And if I walk straight, I'll get out without bumping myself into the chairs and into the, all sorts of the benches and people like that and climbing over people. I will walk straight. But if I want to start walking and off the path and exploring what's up this road, what's up that road, I will go down so many rabbit holes that you will not see me for a long time. And I will refuse to be deceived and de uh, with anything that's going on because my focus is clearly functioning straight at Jesus Christ and what he did and his finished work. And trust me, it's a finished work on the cross. So this morning's message really is about communion and about how we can have communion. And we take the word communion and we just throw it about lightly. Some people put holy communion in front of it and they think, well, maybe that'll give it a little bit more oomph. I want to tell you something that when you have communion, it's a beautiful, sacred thing. And when Jesus gives us communion, our eyes open to who him, who he is, what he has done, and, and, and for everything like that. In the Garden of Eden, when, when the, the, the serpent was, was cursed, God said to the serpent, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all your life. What was man made of? Dust. What made dust different from humans? The breath of God. Once we get the breath of God into us, we get attacked by the one who's going around. Peter says, like a roaring lion, he's going around trying to eat up 
the dust. The dust is something that blows either in the wind. The, the dust is not secure. The dust has got no anchor. The dust has got no hope. The dust just blows all over the place. And that's what he's looking for. People that haven't got an anchor in life, just like a piece of dust that'll blow away. And when you have that, <clears throat> when you've got that anchor, you've got something that's really firm. He came along and he was eating up the dust of the earth and mankind was falling left, right and center. And we find that Eve took and she decided to eat from a tree that she was told not to eat of and bringing in disobedience into the world. And her husband Adam ate at the same time. And as soon as they ate, guess what happened? Their eyes were opened and they realized, you know, ah, we, boy, we are naked. We are, in other words, God was no longer, they were no longer in communion. If we, if we flip forward and we go to the, and we go to the, uh, the two men on the road to a mess, if we go forward there and we see what happened to them. They didn't see him. They didn't recognize him until when? Until he broke the bread, until communion. So it's the communion with God that opens our eyes. It's the communion with God that opens our eyes. And if we don't have communion with God, we open, it opens our eyes to us being naked and being nothing and being like dust. If we have communion with the presence of Jesus Christ right there, then we know that we, our hearts will burn within us. And instead of hiding behind all sorts of false and fake things that sew together, we will want to run back to the children of God and we will want to tell them that we have seen the risen Christ. Good morning. Welcome to the rock. Communion. Communion. What is it? Right, well, first of all, let me, uh, let, let me pin this on to the end of that sermon. <laughs> and our taking of communion, uh, you know, has in the church, it's been something that's been turned, and not, not just this church, I'm talking about churches generally, it's been turned into a, a ritual. You know, that some churches say that it actually turns into the flesh, that, that the, 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 the wine actually turns into the, the blood. And I think I'm going to use a, a hand mic because this one, I believe, is giving me a jippo. So if you could just bear with me a second. And we'll get the hand mic up. So communion is, is it, it's become part of a process. It's become a part. You know what communion has become? It's become a responsibility instead of a response. Uh, a responsibility is something, oh, we, well, we have to do that. Do you have communion in your church? Oh, yes, we have it every week. As if like, yeah, there's, we've got the badge for that. We've got the badge for, for having it every week. Jesus says just to do this in remembrance of him. We do it in remembrance of him. We, 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 but we, when, he, when the Bible says to do it in remembrance of him, it's not doing it the way that we often do it. And, and not just us, I'm talking about other Christians throughout the world, throughout the whole world, whether you go into the Eastern Orthodox or you go into the Pentecostal Americans, it becomes a ritual instead of a rite. It is a rite that we take and we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We come into a church, we you, you get welcomed, um, we sing a few songs, and they were actually excellent this morning, and I could feel the Spirit of God here this morning. We, we then take the emblems, we slow down, we preach, we sing, and then we go home. And guess what? We'll do it all again next week. And that is so exciting. Well, I want to tell you something that we've got to come to the reality. We are come to the time now. We're getting closer and closer and closer to the day when, when the, the Bible tells us to look up because our salvation is drawing nigh. And I can tell you it's drawing very, very close Every Christian is being squashed. Every Christian is being pressurized. Everybody's coming in. It's from him from the top and the sides. And Paul says, that even though that will happen to us, we will not faint. We will not faint. We will carry on. We will, we will, be, we will keep going. We lose the purpose of the communion. 
when we keep doing the same thing, what we're supposed to do with communion is to have a reenaction of Christ on the cross. And remember that. Remember that it's a reenaction. We look at it as a responsibility. It is not. It's a response. It's not about my responsibility for God. He doesn't need to be me to be responsible for him. It's like the man who tried to steady up the Ark of the Covenant. He was struck down. God says, I don't need your help. You need my help. It's, not, it's a response he's wanting. It's not about me. It's about, it's about my response to the Spirit. It's my response to his call. It's, a, it's my response to his anointing. It's my response to his love. It's my response to his favor. And it's my response to his chastisement when he teaches me that I've done something wrong and I get chastised for it. That's, I have to respond to that. It's my response for the correction that he takes me and gives me. It's my response to the wisdom that he's given me. It's my re response to the compassion that he lays on my heart when I see other people, when I see people suffering. Somewhere along the line, communion became a responsibility. And you know what? Let's read a few verses. I'm going to open up the Bible, and I'm reading from the King James Version, and I'm going to look up at, at, at what Paul said. Now, Paul's talking in Corinthians, the first book of Corinthians, and we're going to look at uh, chapter 11. And Paul had a problem with the Corinthian church. They were split. They were arguing. They were in little cliques all over the place. And, and uh, I, I've seen this in some churches, and I've seen this in some churches you wouldn't expect to see it. But there's little cliques in form, and, and everybody knows this person and that, but not everybody knows everybody. And Paul had this problem, and that's why we get that, that love chapter. You know, it's always read out in, in weddings, you know, love is patient, love is kind. He's not talking at a wedding. He's talking to the church. He's telling them that they must buck their ideas up and that they must, you know, they must love. They must be patient. They must be kind if they're following Christ. But somehow we read it, and it sounds a little bit different. The institution of the Lord's Supper. Paul said... For, I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'm going to stop. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, this is Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Isn't that, isn't that, doesn't that come across as a bit strange? Eh? You, you're, you're, say you were at the table, and you're at this supper, and he hasn't been crucified. And he takes a piece of bread, and he passes it over to John or Peter. He passes over to one of the disciples, and he says, this is my body. Eat it. It's been broken for you. No, it hasn't. He hasn't been crucified yet. You must have thought, they must have thought, hmm, well, let's go along with it and see what he says. Do this in remembrance of me. Oh, wow, do this in remembrance of me. Yeah. When we look at the, the, the actual Greek of, of those, that particular phrase, do this in remembrance of me, we actually... We, we miss quite a bit. Remembrance of me, it means that you are the participant. Now, you become like Christ. You are the participant. Participant, um, of your remembering Christ and the penalty of his suffering and death he endured. That's what we've got to remember, that of what he endured. It's not just a case of, well, I'll pop this into my mouth and that, that's it. Um, uh, and we'll do it again. Um, it's a case of you've got to be aware of the penalty, a penalty of his suffering. Do it, but replay it. Think of him hanging between heaven and earth, hanging on a cross, hanging there, 
suffering, that he was bleeding and he was crying, he was weeping, he was, he was there for us. So today, when we, we break the bread and, and he handed it, Jesus is saying, this, this is my body. He's telling his disciples at the table before the crucifixion, he says it was broken for you. And I'm handing it to you. I'm giving you the bread now before the crucifixion. I'm giving it to you. I'm, this is broken for you. And, and they must have been surely puzzled. And then he gives them a glass of wine. And he says, this is my blood that's shed for you. It hadn't been shed for them at that point in time. They must have been taking it. And then he goes on and he says to them that not only has it been shed to you, he said that this is the new covenant. A covenant was very important to Jewish people. They had a covenant. They had a covenant with Moses that had been going for hundreds of years. And now Jesus is saying, here, take a piece of this bread because this is my body and take this wine and because it's my blood. And this is a, the new covenant. This is a covenant between me and you. And a covenant was very, very important. He says, I took a piece of myself and I gave it to you for your sins. Now, we can think of this on a personal level, and we must think of it on a personal level. He says, I took my blood and paid for your sins. In other words, he has redeemed you back to him. Remember when we spoke about the redemption of the firstborn, I redeemed you back. He has bought, paid for you back. You're bought back. And you're not only bought back, but you're washed as well. You're, you're, you're totally washed. You, sometimes we just think that taking it is our Christian duty. Yeah, well, we'll take, a, we'll take the breaking bread. Or we'll not take it because mm, I don't feel so good. Uh, I don't feel worthy enough to take it. We'll come to that in a minute. We have had a, a man sacrificing himself on our behalf. He didn't just do it for, for my sins, but he did it for my responsibilities. Think about that. Yeah, let's give, give, him, give all our sins. Um, and what have we done afterwards? Well, a lot of my responsibilities have been stupid. I haven't left it, I left it up to them. I have, I've, I've carried around a lot of guilt and things that I've done. I've done. I'm, I'm talking about me, but I'm talking about you as well. It must be going through your head. You must be saying there's things that I've done that I, yeah, really, you know, I won't even, I'm not even going to tell my best friend these certain things that I've done. Jesus knows. And know what he's done? He said, I've taken those responsibilities away from you on your behalf. He just didn't die for the sin. He died for your stupidity. He died for your transgressions. He died for all the religious stuff that you thought you had to do to get to heaven. We're not going to heaven because of what we do. We're going to heaven because of what we believe. It's our faith that gets us there. You can't be saved any more than you're saved. Jesus came along and said, it was never about doing, it was about believing. And then he said, I'm going to do all the stuff on your behalf so that you are free to believe so that you're free to believe. See, this communion stuff happened before he even died. He was sitting at the table, before he was taken away, before he was tried, before he went to Gethsemane, before he sweated the drops of blood, before he had to go before, before Herod, all of that, before he went before Caiaphas, he told them, this is my body, this is the bread, you take it. When I'm giving it to you, you take it. This is my blood. This is shed. It's the new covenant. So Jesus invited them to step into this new covenant. Enter into it for them. Do you know what a big deal that would have been? A new, co a new covenant? Moses had a covenant with God at Mount Sinai. We haven't had one since. This is a new covenant? And you want me to take it and say that this is your body and this is your blood, and you want us to take it? 
That was a big deal. We come to church on the Sunday morning. I'm not just talking about us. I'm talking about the people who are watching on YouTube or watching on their TV sets at home. But sometimes it's so blasé. Some people won't take it because, oh, well, it's not the proper juice. Or, it, oh, no, is that, is that wine? Or is, it, or is it grape juice? People will argue the toss, whether it should be wine or whether it should be grape. I don't care, and Bev certainly doesn't care, if it is even Pepsi. Because I'll tell you what, it's an emblem. It's a symbol of what he did. It's the, the reality is what we care about. It's, it's the reality that, that we care about. So this is what I'm saying. Is we will reenact it because there is power. There is power in taking the blood of Jesus. We sing it. There's power in the blood. But yet of all, we become insipid when, we, when, when, we're, when we're doing it. Uh, this morning, we're going to do it a bit different. Instead of just giving it out, you drinking it, and then somebody giving you a piece of bread, and you eating it, and then you, the collection taking place, the way I've asked them to do it this morning is that they're going to come up with a piece of the bread, and they're going to break it. They're going to break it, whoever's giving it out, uh, they're going to break it, and they're going to hand it to you, okay? It's, when they do that, just think. It's Jesus handing it to you across the supper table just before he was crucified. This is my body. Take it and be, benefit, be, be, be beneficial of what is going to happen to you because this is your salvation. This is going to make you a new creation. And we walk around as if we're not a new creation. We walk around full of complaints and moans and we look at the TV and we see the news and we see nothing but doom and gloom on TV and then people will come up with all sorts of theories and, and stuff to try and say well it's going this way and the God's plan is that way I'm telling you God has not revealed any plan like that to me the plan that God has revealed is his plan of redemption which I find in the Bible so when you take it when you take it, you take it by faith, not by what you've done. Oh, I, I, this morning, oh, you know, uh, the neighbor, uh, uh, I just ignored him because I really don't like looking at it. Just take it by faith. That's the first thing. The second thing is you are worthy. You are worthy to take it, each and every one of you and me and every Christian who's listening to this is worthy. You're worthy to take it. Oh, but pastor, if you just read down a little bit, you will see some people were not worthy, so therefore if we think we're not worthy, then we won't take it. So we will read down and see what the Bible, what the Bible says and not what people have told you. Therefore, Paul says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now that's that it, everybody says that's plain enough. If you take it unworthy, it doesn't say that. It says if you take it in an unworthy manner. What is an unworthy manner? The Bible is very, very clear, and I don't know why preachers and people don't get it right. For he who eats and drinks it in an unworthy manner, how do you eat it in an unworthy manner? He goes on to tell you, he says, and you drink judgment to himself. What judgment is there to yourself? If Jesus says he died on the cross to take away your judgment, and the finished work on the cross is finished now because you're taking breaking of bread, there is no judgment for yourself. So what are you doing? You're putting it back onto yourself again. He drinks judgment to himself. Why? Because you're not discerning the Lord's body. You're not discerning the piece of bread and the, the juice that has been handed to you. You're not discerning that he has redeemed you. You're not discerning that. If you can't discern what you're taking it for, don't take it. 
but you should be discerning what you're taking it for because if you're a Christian, it means you are a new creation. And if you're a new creation, it means you've been saved. If you've been saved, it means you've been redeemed. And if you've been redeemed, it means Jesus has shed his blood for you. For the reason many of you are weak and sick among you uh, and, and some of you fall asleep is because you're full of moans and groans and you don't accept that Christ has set you free. Now, that's, that's, that's one thing. It doesn't say that what, what, what we think it says. It says, don't take it in an unworthy manner. Jesus did say that the judgment he has taken upon himself so you keep thinking you've got to take your judgment and you walk around life forever with guilt trips, with guilt in your life. I mean, the older you get, the guiltier you can become because as your life builds up and then you cast your mind back. Isn't it amazing how you can cast your mind back to things that you don't want to think about? Isn't it amazing how you're going to take the breaking of bread and a little, so a little voice will tell you, you're not worthy. I want you to rebuke that little voice in your head because that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you are worthy. because Why? Because he made you worthy. Otherwise, you're just trampling him underfoot because what he did, he did for you and he did for me, and he's taken everything on that cross, everything. So if you want to be free of, of, of you bearing your own judgment, like it says here, then take communion. Otherwise, you're judging yourself and you have no right to. Take it realizing he did it for you. Otherwise, you'll be carrying your guilt until you die. Here's what happened. He wrapped himself. God wrapped himself in human flesh. He lived as a man, a perfect man. He died for me and you. He rose from the dead for me. He now lives inside of me and you. He now lives in us. So with all the worry in the world that's going on, we can celebrate that we are children of God. That's what we can celebrate. When we take communion, we get to observe, and this is important, taking communion, when it's passed to you, it's like Jesus passing it to you, as if reenacted, you're there. You're there, you're, you're at that supper. You take it. You take that and observe that very moment when Jesus hangs between heaven and earth and he says, I am doing this so that you don't have to. Take it and take it with both hands if you have to. Take emblems and wait. Do not rush them. Just take them and wait. How do I know? But how, Lord Pastor, how do I know that I'm worthy? I'm worthy. Well, he died for you. That makes you worthy. If you had to worry about your, your stuff and everything that you've done, what's the point of him dying on the cross in the first place? What's the point of church? What's the point of him giving the bread out in the body? What's the point of anything? If we can't take that and believe what he says, communion is observing his creation the moment we were created. Because the moment that you responded to him on the cross, to that moment, you were a new creature. And that's what we observe when we take it because we are reenacting it. He's on the cross. He says, here's my body. Here's my blood. The blood has just set you free. You've been redeemed. As you take it, feel redeemed. Feel that your aches and your pains have gone. Feel that your mind has gone. Your mind is the biggest playground of Satan. Make sure that you know, oh, but I, you know, maybe I, I haven't been such a good person. It, it's not about being good. It's about believing. It's about believing. It's not based on your performance. He died. That's real. And what I, what, what I, I really believe is that he died for me. We will partake corporately, but as though we, uh, when we're partaking, because we're all going to partake of it together, but when we partake of it together, remember we're going to have it individually. So we'll all be doing it at the same time, and anybody listening at home or wherever you're watching this from, you can go and now and get yourself something. It doesn't have to be wine, doesn't have to be grape juice, doesn't have to be mat sauce. It can be anything. It's an emblem. The only thing that's real is Jesus and his salvation for you.
Forget about everything else. Remember Matthew 24 about deception. Forget about the deception. Just think about the reality of what Christ said. You go, we take it together, we wait. We wait with the bread, we wait with, with the juice that we, we're, we're going to have. And then we're going to take it together. But while we're taking it together, I want each and every one of you to individually remember what is bugging you. What is on your mind? Lord, this is what I need. Jesus says, I died for you all. I died for you. I've taken everything that you could have. I've taken it. So whatever it is, whether it's financial, whether it's leg problem, whether it's, it's back problem, whether it's mind problem, whether it's depression, oppression, Think, say, Lord, do you know what I'm doing? You said this is a new covenant. Do you know what you do with a covenant? You take what one person has and you give them what you have. Lord, this is what I've got. I've got this in my mind and I'm giving it to you. And what I'm going to take from you, Lord, I'm going to take redemption because that's what you've offered me and I'm taking it and I'm saved and I believe it. And that's what we must do. We must take it. I want to close with Isaiah 53. And I just want to, you to listen to what, what the prophet, hundreds of years before Jesus, what he prophesied about the Messiah. He was wounded for our transgressions. That means he was pierced through for you. He was bruised for our iniquities. Bruised, crushed. When I looked up these words, it means he was crushed for our iniquities. What's that? Oh, it's a, it's a word that they use in the Bible. Iniquities, it's your sin, and it's your guilt, and it's your crime, and it's your correction. It's, and it's fault. I'm not perfect. I, I, I've got faults. He died for your faults. And the chastisement will be to make us better. To, for chastisement will correct us. Why? For our peace was upon him. He took our judgment so that we would have peace with God. And eventually, when we pro pronounce and proclaim Jesus Christ, we will get peace in our hearts of God. We will get peace. He was scourged. By his stripes we are healed. And that was written hundreds of years before Jesus. And it's written in past tense. It's not by his stripes you will be healed. It's by his stripes you are healed. Written then. It's in past tense. It's the scripture that we have to hang on to. Because those stripes that, were, that are healed are the stripes of salvation, are the stripes of redemption, are the stripes of bondage, are the stripes that are bringing you out from a dark place into a place of light. You're going to be put into a wonderful place in my Father's house. There are many mansions that are not true. I would have told you so. May God bless you. We're going to now start giving out the emblems. And I would just like to everybody to just... Start giving out the emblems, and those giving them out, and it doesn't have to be this, it can be anybody doing it, um, just give them out. But as you give it to the people, break it on their behalf and give it to them. Let them hold it in their hand, and when you give them the, the juice, do the same thing. He was wounded for our transgressions. Wow. He, was, he, was, he hung on a cross. He... The, the, the communion is so important, the reenactment uh, of it. I don't know if many people saw uh, movies and, and, and you got the tears when you saw what Jesus went through. He went through far more than what any film could do. He went through lots of it. Break it, and as they're being handed it, this is Jesus is handing it to you because we're doing a reenactment. We're not saying that... that Lynn is Jesus. We're saying that this is the reenactment of what happened when he pushed it across the table to John, to Peter, to Judas, who betrayed him, pushed it across to him, and they partook of it. 
And do what happened to Judas. We find that what happened to Judas was he hung himself. In the book of Acts chapter 1, it says that he hung himself so much that his, his stomach burst open. His bowels hung out. If you can just take the, 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 the wine as well. I'll take my, uh, I'll help myself when I'm ready to go. His bowels burst out. He'd taken the breaking of bread. He'd taken that. What happened? His bowels burst open. What was in his bowels? The very thing that would have redeemed him. The bread and the wine. Jesus is our Savior, our Redeemer, our King. He is everything to us. We must never, ever lose sight. Do not lose sight. Do not be sidetracked. Do not go this way and do not go that way. Always walk in the straight and narrow path of the knowledge of Christ. And when I'm saying that, I'm not talking about the knowledge of man. I'm talking about the knowledge of Christ. Let the Spirit guide you. Let the Holy Spirit talk to you and tell you what you want to do, where you want to go, what job you want to be in. You let the Spirit of God just go and do it. Okay, uh, girls, just go and give out the... Then everybody will hold. You've got your bread. Has everybody got it? Nobody's eaten it yet. I see somebody chewing. No? Okay. Spit it out. Yeah. (laughs) Just everybody hold it. And we're all going to take it, and we're going to take it together. And corporately, corporately, we'll take it, but individually, you will be praying for what is holding you back. Maybe it's a memory of the past. Maybe it's something that that you're carrying around, and you, you know you don't need to carry it around. But now, as a corporate body, we can actually say, Lord, we are giving this to you because we are now entered into that covenant. You've entered into that covenant when you were saved, and now you are reenacting it again, and you will, you will be set free. I'll just take one of those, and I'll just, if, if someone could just hand it to me, and if you could also give me, um, break me a piece of bread, please. Thank you so much. And once you guys are seated, then we'll carry, we'll carry on. Jesus, who was, who was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, came along and he said, this is my body, this, 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 take, eat. And as you put this into your mouth, it still will be bread, okay? It's not going to miraculously change into his body. But when you put this in your mouth, re- remember the enactment. Remember the skin that was being flailed off of him while he was being scourged, while he was being stoned, while he's being spat at, while his beard was being pulled. Just remember that. And as you remember that, he did it for you. Th- just say, thank you, Lord, in your mind, and, and, and say, Lord, this is the problem that I've got. And just speak to the Spirit privately to yourself. We're not in a hurry, but let's just take it together. Lord, we take this bread. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Have. We thank you for what you did for us, that you hung on that cross, that that you were condemned, that you were convicted, that you fulfilled the prophecies, that you you became the Messiah, that you are the Messiah. We look forward to the time when, when you're coming back again. We take this bread, and we know it's your body. And by taking that, we are taking your body into us, inside us, inside our physical body, we are taking this bread. That bread is symbolic of you. Our temples, are, our, our bodies, our temples, they are just a, they, they will fade away. 
But inside, Lord, inside our spirit, inside our soul, we know that you're there. And we're reenacting that now by, by, by letting our mind and, and letting the evil one know that we are standing up and we are taking your body into us, and we ha we're doing it by faith. And it's by faith that we have got the substance where we can believe in you. And we thank that, Lord. And Lord, as we take up the cup, you said this is the cup of the new covenant. We have entered into that new covenant when we, when we, when, when we responded to you. And we take this cup, and the cup, we're taking is of great juice but lord it's the blood that was shed for us we are remembering and reenacting that and as that cup goes down and we feel it going down our throats just let us remember lord that that is our cleansing you cleansed us you washed us whiter than snow you have taken away our sin our guilt our faults our iniquities and it's all washed away. Lord, whatever ailment I have or the people have now, anybody who's listening, whatever ailment, just pray it that it'll go away. And in this corporate taking of the bread and the communion wine, I pray, Lord, that in the name, in the powerful name of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, Hamashiach, If we can just wait for a minute in silence and pray and just let your body and your mind absorb the greatness that happened in Golgotha 2,000 years ago where a man wasn't just killed but took on everything that we should have taken on and was raised again on the third day. Praise you, Lord. We thank you for what you have done. And whenever we take this again, whenever we take it again, if we don't have to be in church to take it, whenever we take it again, we just remember we will reenact once again of that horrific death, but that wonderful sacrifice that you did for us. You laid your life down to give us life. You died. You lost your breath so that we could gain breath, the heavenly breath, and we give you thanks for it. And Father, we now thank you for the horrible sacrifice that must have been for you. And we pray a blessing upon you as well. And we thank you for saving us by grace through the faith that has been enabled through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.